shortly, within a day of uh, killing Mr. Alexander, she finds herself making out with somebody by the name of Brian Burns. Is that indi you know, contra indicated to this markedly diminished interest? That is a symptom of what I highlighted earlier, but borderline personality disorder. So that, that, that does not have anything to do with this markedly diminished intent? No. Interest. What, what does that have to do, this involving Mr. Burns, what does that have to do or how does that fit in with your diagnosis of borderline personality disorder? I highlighted earlier that people with this disorder tend to have the tendency to either idealize or devalue people. So what you see in this situation is Miss Arias just engaged in a killing and was able to then go and have a, a romantic encounter with an individual shortly after. What that suggests is there, there a flip occurred. Earlier I talked about how there's a flip between idealizing and devaluing. To be able to go and engage in the way that she did uh, and not have any uh, sort of external cues that it was problematic suggests that she was at that point of devaluing someone, despising. And next, what is the next item? Feeling of detachment or estrangement from others. Or estrangement, did you say? Correct. Okay, what is that? Similar to what I highlighted earlier, feeling like you're, you can't be around people, you're not part of the crowd, staying away from people, you feel a sense of uh, being separated, estranged from them. And does she meet, meet this or not? No. Why not? Because of the th things that I highlighted earlier. So tell me what they are. Related to her activities afterwards, related to her engaging in uh, social activities with friends, with her uh, going again to the memorial and meeting up with people that she was familiar with. All right. She, her her um, tendency, she was going to go camping at one point. And so, again, she does not meet that, correct? Correct. Next. Restricted range of affect. Restricted range of affect? Is correct. That And what is that? You can think of it as having a blunted level of affect, essentially shortening um, the amount of emotion that you can have. So someone may not be able to have feelings of love during that time, um, not be able to have any kind of drastic emotions or experiences. And this was, again, if we go back to her journal, she's talking in there about how much she loves Mr. Alexander after the killing, um, there was no indication that there, this was a symptom that represented her. And last is back in the borderline personality disorder concerning Jody Arias. And last is what? Sense of foreshortened future. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Sense of foresh foreshortened future. Sense of foreshortened future? Yes. Okay, what is that? Individuals with PTSD often have a time seeing what their future is going to be like. They're so caught up in the emotional turmoil that they're experiencing as a result of the trauma that they tend to talk about themselves as nothing outside of that trauma. So contrary to that, they're, they're not talking about dating, courting other men, um, what their career will look like. And these are things that I saw in this area. Specifically, what are you talking about that you did see in the defendant? Well, in her, her journal entry, she spoke about courting other men. Any, anything else? How about her job? Did she have a job? She did have a job. So, so far, we've seen that B and C are not met. Does that mean at this point that this is not um, a diagnose, diagnosis of PTSD that is appropriate? That's correct. But let's talk about D and tell us about... It's increased arousal is the general category. The first one is difficulty falling or staying asleep.
And how many of these are there? There are five. And how many do you have to meet? Two. Okay, difficulty falling or staying asleep. Did you talk to the defendant about that? We did talk about sleep. And what did she say? She indicated when she first got to jail that she had difficulty sleeping, but it was because of the loud noises that were in the jail. So doesn't that sort of seem to fall in, under this category if she's having difficulty falling asleep because of the noise in the jail or not? No, we're looking to remember at the etiology of it. Where did this come from? What is this a result of? And again, I'm going to try and link this back to the actual trauma. In this case, it does not meet criteria because it's not associated with the trauma. So it's not associated with any trauma is what you're saying? Right. It's a change in environment. Next. Irritability or outburst of anger. Okay, does she meet this? Consistent with what I highlighted before, that this is much more of a personality pattern that we see with her. Any symptom that would be suggestive of PTSD, we would expect that the symptom emerged only after they were exposed to the trauma, not as a pattern throughout their life. So no, just, she does not seem to meet the symptom. And going against that is Exhibit 623, where she talks about these outbursts of anger, correct? That's correct. Next. Difficulty concentrating. I think we know what that means. Why don't you tell us what, what it means to you? The ability to maintain and sustain attention. Um, there was indication by Ms. Arias that concentration was an area that she has struggled with, uh, with a tendency to be uh, clumsy, was also highlighted in the records. Um, again, we're looking for symptoms that would occur after the traumatic event. This does not seem to be a new symptom for Ms. Arias. All right. So she doesn't meet that either, then? That's correct. And number four of the five? Hypervigilance. What is that? I explained earlier that hypervigilance hyper is a tendency to be really hyper aware of your environment, to know what's going on around. And this is a protective measure. When you're exposed to a traumatic event, your body gets heightened. So you look around, make sure you're safe. And I was, I was fortunate enough to um, have videos of Miss Arias shortly after the killing um, in the video that she participated in related to 48 hours and her police videos where I would be able to observe that symptom if it was present. And was it present in those videos that you observed? It was not present. Janine Demarty, psychologist, uh, witness for the prosecution, rebuttal witness simply does not buy. Finally, number five under this category. Is what? Exaggerated startle response. Exaggerated, what was it again? Startle. Oh, startle response. What are we talking about there? The tendency to get startled very easily and also, like it says, exaggerated. So instead of just maybe a quick little jerk that someone may have if they hear a noise, we would see um, an exaggerated kind of jerk. So it's a startle response. And did you see this uh, with regard to the defendant? No, and again, I was, I was lucky enough to have the records that I did and that it showed me her behavior shortly after. And there were times in the video where doors were slamming and there were noise that uh, I would expect to see that kind of symptom. And did you see that? No. So based on this um, assessment, do you agree or disagree uh, with Dr. Samuels as to the post-traumatic stress disorder. She does not have post-traumatic stress disorder. How about with regard to Dr. Carp? Do you agree with her assessment that this was PTSD due to this pattern, if you will, of abuse? No. Are you familiar with the term or with the, um, yeah, the term adjustment disorder? Yes, I am. What is that? Ad adjustment disorder is uh, refers it's a psychological disorder that refers to a change in behavior as a result of something that happens in someone's environment essentially it's um uh, in the case of miss arias um i did diagnose her with a so this is something that you looked at in addition to this uh borderline personality disorder that's correct do you know whether or not 
Ms. Dr. Samuels addressed this issue in his report. He did not give her this diagnosis. And he, did, he didn't indicate either way with regard to that, correct? Correct. Ma'am, are you familiar with the issue involving the defendant's, or are you familiar with memory issues as they apply in this particular case? Yes. Tell me about the memory issues that are involved in this case, that, as you know them. As I highlighted earlier, she indicated that she has a very large memory gap of the night of the killing. Well, are you familiar with the fight or flight issue as it applies to memory? Yes. Uh, tell me about, first of all, what fight or flight is, and then we'll talk about the memory issue. Sure. Fight or flight is a response. It's a fear response that occurs in a situation where there's some sort of stimulus that is causing fear. In that situation, our body essentially prepares to protect itself. So the way that it prepares to protect itself is that our, our, our blood flows to those places that are gonna help us protect yourself, like our muscle groups, to be able to run fast enough. Our body sweats so that um, from an evolutionary perspective, if the tiger bites onto us, it'll slide off easier. Our body essentially prepares to protect ourselves. And how is memory affected during she these fight or flight situations? It becomes secondary because our body is trying to protect ourselves. And so what happens in terms of whether or not a person can remember or not remember what's going on. So during these times, what we there are times that people have memory gaps, and during these times, we see that behaviorally they act very different. Um, in that, because there's parts of their brain that are losing access to the typical blood flow that it would have, we see that different areas of the brain don't act in the same way that it does. For example, our frontal lobe is what helps dictate our ability to organize, our ability to plan, all these kind of higher order functions that we do as humans that, for example, we wouldn't expect a dog to be able to do, organize, plan full behavior. When someone's in a fight or flight mode, we don't see those kinds of behaviors. They're completely just trying to run and protect themselves or fight. You don't see any of that other kind of higher, what we call higher order behaviors. And did you see any? higher order behaviors here that speak against the fight or flight memory loss issue. Objection, Judge Mary Coach. Yes. Oh, With regard to this issue about fight or flight and uh, this issue about uh, the memory afterwards, in terms of the memory, and I'm just talking about the memory afterwards, uh, were there elements that of what happened after the killing that indicate to you that this was not a felony, not a felony, but a, a, a fight or flight circumstance. There was indication to me that this was not fight or flight. Why, why is that? And, and be specific about it. Related to? After the killing, correct. Related Anything to behavior? having to do after the killing, not before the killing. During the killing. Judge, perhaps we could take a break now. Yeah. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take